and welcome to Scientist Warning TV. I'm Alison Green and I have taken over as the new Executive Director of Scientist Warning, which many, many of you will know from our previous things that we've put on our channel. Um, our, you, we are dedicated to protecting life on Earth and raising warnings about the climate, climate crisis, the ecological emergency. Um, please do take a minute to subscribe to our channel if you've watched this and you'd like to get some further um, notifications about our new items, then please do subscribe and we will, we will send you those automatically. Um, we're called Scientist Warning and I thought that we could not have a better first guest on my new Heroes in Science series than Professor Bill Ripple, who was the author of The Second Warning to Humanity and the recent climate emergency paper. So it's a great honor to be talking to Bill today, who is a distinguished professor of ecology at Oregon State University. Um, and very apt as well, given that this today, June the 5th, is World Environment Day. Um, so I can't think of a better guest and a better day to have this, this interview. So Bill, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, about yourself um, about your background um, and how you came to be an, like, an ecologist. Um, I understand your, 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 one of your interests is in researching wolves and apex predators. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, about your background and who you are. Well, thank you, Alison. It's great to be here today. And I've always been interested in, in nature and the environment. And anyway, that carried through to, through my university uh, education. and. I eventually uh, ended up studying uh, uh, lots of different uh, types of systems. Uh, I worked on uh, spotted owls in the Pacific Northwest of uh, the United States for a number of years. And uh, they're a, uh, an endangered uh, species. And uh, so that was quite interesting and I also uh, have, uh, soon after I finished the Spotted Owl work, I got interested in a project in Yellowstone National Park. So uh, back in 1996, I became aware of a mystery, and this is a scientific mystery, where the trees in, in Yellowstone were declining. These are aspen trees, and nobody really knew why they were dying off and not regenerating. So we went out there and we cored the trees and we were able to do a tree ring study. And we found that the aspen trees died off about the same time that the wolves were killed off. So we developed this theory that wolves affect the, their prey and their prey affects the plants. Therefore, wolves indirectly affect the plants. So, uh, I've been working on that project for over 20 years. And, uh, but interestingly, I've been feeling very strange uh, the last few years in that the news about the global environmental situation is just getting, seems like it's getting worse and worse. So we have this, uh, what I call the convergence of crises. We have uh, a biodiversity crisis where we're probably in the sixth great extinction now. And that's very troubling. Uh, we have uh, a climate crisis that is seems to be um, getting much worse and worse than predicted by scientists. And then we have all types of other types of environmental issues like a scarcity of fresh water. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, we have huge wildlife conservation problems. Okay. We have um, all kinds of the, of these uh, environmental things that have been bothering me. So I decided, rather than just enjoy myself doing huh? ecological field work, I would um, transform myself into a science and conservation advocate. So that's why I started on this new path um, in 2017. 60% of the large carnivores in the world are threatened with extinction. And here you can see a list of those that are threatened. And this was shocking to me. I always heard about problems with different species, but I didn't know that most of them are threatened. 
um, including the bears and the canids and the felids and the otters. So back in 1992, when the, 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 the warning to humanity was published, and I'm just going to read a little bit about that and, and ask you a little bit about it. So in late 1992, the, the late um, Henry W. Kenville, former chair of the Union of Concerned Scientists, Board of Directors, wrote the first warning, world scientist warning to, to humanity, which begins, human beings in the natural world are on a collision course. And a majority of the Nobel Prize laureates in the sciences signed the document, and about 1,700 of the world's leading scientists appended their signature, which is hugely powerful. You know, you've got the world's leading scientists and Nobel laureates. And, and I looked at that article again today, and it calls for action now, and it talks about critical areas such as atmosphere, oceans, water resources, and so on. Um, and for you as a scientist, having looked at that, because you must have been aware of that at the time, can you, were you aware of that article and do you, did, you, did it have impact at that time? Uh, as far as I know, that uh, 1992 warning had very little impact on, uh, on policy globally. One thing is that uh, that's, 92 is before the, the internet became widely used. So uh, Henry Kendall was able to get signatures through the mail system. So uh, that was quite a feat because he, he got um, quite a few important signatures on his 1992 warning. But then I, uh, I've been researching uh, Kendall and the 92 warning and I found that they tried to do a press release uh, when they uh, released it. They did not actually publish it. It was just an open letter. And they asked the, uh, the press to attend a press conference in New York City. Uh, and there was not much press. I think uh, one television network covered it and there's still a recording of that out there. But like, for example, the New York Times refused to even uh, write anything about it. That's astonishing. And, uh, and since it wasn't uh, published in a journal, it really was forgotten. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, in 1997, in, no, in 2017, I was giving a lecture at the University of California and I was describing the, the world population issue and one of the uh, attendees in that lecture uh, talked to me afterwards and he said, thank you for talking about uh, population issues, which most scientists don't. And he mentioned the 1992 warning also talked about human population crisis. And uh, I read that for the first time in February of 2017 and I was struck. And I realized that it's been exactly 25 years since the first warning to humanity, and that since then, there should be good global uh, environmental data uh, over time that I could plot. And then I thought, well, maybe I could uh, pen a new warning to humanity. So that was just conceived all of a sudden in February of 2017, and by November, it was published with 15,000 signatories. Yeah. And that was, that was quite a wake up call. The, the very fact that the scientific community had to issue a second warning because the first one wasn't sufficient. And it's interesting what you say about the, obviously the dissemination of the first one was, was, was hampered, I guess, by you know, the internet not being what it is today and so on. But, um, but even so, you know, one would think that something as stark as that in 92 would have had more impact and clearly it didn't. So I think for you in 2017, and other scientists around the world, it must be absolutely galling to, to, to look back and, and think that these messages have been issued again and again and again with little impact. So going on to the, the 2017 paper, the second warning to humanity, I think you, you sort of explained something about um, why you came to do that. Do you want, can you just summarize for us what, what the article actually says? Well, um, what we, we did in the 2017 paper, that second warning to humanity, we uh, picked up on the topics of the first warning. So we uh, had, uh, and then we made a set of graphs that relate to the first warning. And so we wanted to be able to 
track how we have done over the last 25 years. So we did, we, we, we plotted population, human population, and we plotted um, marine fisheries, and we plotted um, uh, wildlife in terms of the decline of vertebrate species and the abundance of vertebrate species. We plotted uh, the increase in um, ruminant livestock, and we plotted the increase in greenhouse gas emissions and uh, ocean dead zones. And these are all topics that were mentioned in the, in the 1992 warning. And now we actually put graphs and numbers to it. And I was personally just shocked that everything was getting much worse, except for one topic that uh, Kendall and the 92 people worked on. And that is the ozone layer was much, much better by 2017. So uh, we had that glimmer of hope Mm -hmm. that we can make uh, proper decisions and behaviors, but um, most everything has gotten much, much worse. And uh, we published that and it was, um, it got a lot of attention. Um, and we had uh, more than 15,000 scientists from around the world uh, sign that, that new warning. Yeah. And that's that again, that's a huge number. So to go from 1700 endorsing the one in 92 up to 15,000, and I know that more people signed on after. And it's interesting. Do you, do you get a sense that the, I mean, the one thing that improved was the ozone hole, hole the ozone layer that, you know, that, that showed some improvement. And that was, I remember that being reported in the news. But what wasn't reported was the fact that things were, that other things were getting so much worse. Do you think that the, the, the rate at which things are getting worse, do you think it's accelerating? Yes, yeah, I would call it a great acceleration of, right. okay. of, of uh, these issues, yes. It, it is, um, and it seems like on topics like climate change, uh, the scientists are underestimating how bad uh, it's going to be at any certain time, and they keep revising uh, the estimates. So yeah, I think it's um, it's to the point where uh, I'm spending most of my time just working on these kinds of issues. I'm very concerned. So I think one of the phrases that we hear again and again in the press um, is faster than expected, worse than expected. So we see the, the, the frequency of the, the fires, the wildfires in Australia, for example, just increasing. Um, and they're becoming more and more catastrophic. They're lasting for longer, which is, you know, which is obviously pretty devastating. Um, and for, I think for the ordinary person who doesn't really understand the data, you know, they're not as close to it as, as you and the scientists are. But one of the questions I hear people asking a lot is, well, how, how bad is it, is it really? And how do, you, how, how do you go about, as a scientist, how do you communicate to, to ordinary people how bad things really are, because people don't necessarily understand things like changes in, in CO2 levels. Um, you know, they don't understand what necessarily what, it, what the, you know, the loss of Arctic sea ice might mean. So how, how, how do we explain to people how bad it really is? Do, well, do uh, yeah, thank you for that question. That's a difficult one. Uh, I give uh, presentations and I'm, I try to uh, achieve a balance in terms of uh, give, giving the scientists warnings and uh, which scare people somewhat, at the same time giving them some hope. But uh, in terms of one little story I can tell you is, I for the last um, three years, I've been keeping track of how of what the scientists are saying a little bit more privately. And more and more, I'm seeing scientists say things like, large areas of the earth will become uninhabitable because of climate change. I'm hearing uh, some uh, distinguished scientists saying things like, oh, our future climate may only support 3 billion people or even fewer. So these are uh, simple concepts, 
but uh, one issue that they have is that there's a lot of uncertainty about this. And another one is it's off uh, into the future of which uh, doesn't get the attention that an immediate uh, deadly pandemic would get. So, so you, you, you wrote this paper, it, it was endorsed by huge numbers of, of people. Did, were you hopeful that, that, that it might trigger some significant changes at this point? Were there any, did you, was there anything that gave you hope that, things, that this might trigger some significant changes, it might impact policy, it might be heard? Yes, uh, well, uh, this was my first venture into science advocacy and conservation advocacy on a very large scale. And we had, uh, it changed my life, Allison. Uh, I, ever since November 13th, uh, 2017, my life has changed. The, the mass media did really a good job of covering the paper and social media took off with it also. And there are a number of things that happened after uh, publishing that paper. There is uh, the, uh, the, citizen science, uh, the citizens advocacy group, Scientist Warning, got started. Uh, there's a documentary film about the paper and my work with it and our work. Uh, a documentary film ha is in the works. There is the development of a uh, new scientific organization uh, called the Alliance of World Scientists was started. And I'm heavily involved in operating that uh, organization. And uh, for example, we are now uh, writing narrow-focused scientist warning papers since the, the second warning came out in 2017. And we, there's uh, a lot of papers being uh, written and published uh, with scientist warning as the theme. So uh, I get a lot of emails from scientists in other countries now, and it is, um, very rewarding to see uh, the positive response I'm getting. They're telling me they want to help. They want to work on changing uh, not just uh, people's behavior, but even more importantly, the way governments um, can function and, and policy at the global scale and the national and international scale. Uh, we're looking, uh, I think the problems we have are so, um, severe that we need to have systemic changes in the way um, that we function as a as humanity on planet earth so this takes uh, national international uh, policy changes so um, there have been uh, uh, you know just as one scientist trying to make a difference i'm extremely uh, pleased at the uh, result but on, on the larger scale, um, I'm much more cautious about how optimistic I am that we're actually going to be able to turn the boat and head in a different direction. Yeah, and it must be, I mean, I think for you in particular, being, you know, situated in the U.S. and, you know, here you are, you know, a, a really strong advocate for things that need to be done at the same time witnessing these horrendous rollbacks of every environmental law policy that, that has been passed it, you know, and for, 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 you know, for you and your fellow scientists, it must be absolutely galling to be trying to take steps forward and then find that, you know, you're in a sense taking a step backwards because of all of these policy reversals. The scientists are sometimes criticised, aren't they, for not raising their voices. And there is this sense that there's a kind of mainstream almost sort of narrative, which is conservative, you know, around the science. And I just wondered if you ha if you have a view on that because it, when when I speak to scientists, it seems to me that they they are telling the truth, they are telling it as it is, and that there isn't some kind of watering down of of that truth. Do do you have a, a view on that? Well, um, one thing I'm noticing is scientists are more and more willing to tell it like it is and to speak out more than they used to. So I'm seeing a trend of scientists speaking out. And I think that is essential, especially for uh, mid and senior level uh, career scientists uh, that have the experience and the knowledge 
And uh, I see them stepping up. You know, they are a fairly uh, highly trusted group uh, for citizens to uh, look to for uh, facts and scientific uh, information. And I, I'm encouraged. And, you know, you've been working tirelessly. So in 2017, we had the, the second warning to humanity and then all the other things you've done since. And then late last year, you, you published the, as if a second warning wasn't enough, this time scientists declare climate emergency, which makes, you know, which makes us think, what, what more can scientists possibly do? You know, they've, they've, they've sounded the alarm, now they're saying it's an emergency. Um, and you know, that, that paper, um, when it was published back in November, it, it made the headlines around the world. And I remember, you know, I remember watching the news in the UK and looking at the news stories around you know, the world in the US and Australia. It, it really made the global headlines and it, you know, it, it was massively significant. I just want to look at the, the paper because a lot of my scientist colleagues said it was a great piece of work, you know, because again, you've done the research and you've presented all of these amazing charts and figures um, that, that show very clearly how things are still getting worse. And you outlined six steps in that paper, which are kind of, it's like a roadmap in terms of what, what needs to happen. And I just wondered if you could maybe talk us through those, those six steps. Oh, sure. Well, thank you, Alison for your kind words about the paper. Uh, the, I, first of all, a little bit of background information. I, what I learned on, on the, uh, the second warning that we put out in 2017, I used that knowledge to do the, this newer paper about uh, a scientist's warning of a climate emergency. So uh, that, uh, experience really helped, and um, I was uh, surprised that the uh, the response to the climate emergency warning that we just put out was so much bigger than the response to the second warning uh, in 2017. That was uh, uh, quite interesting. So um, anyway, on the let me just tell back up a little bit and tell you that. Um, uh, we did really well with the 2017 warning and we were going along in 2018 and then again by early 2019 i was feeling really deep down that uh is there anything that i could do like a one-time thing to to help with the climate crisis it seemed like the climate change and the uh, climate crisis was getting so much worse that uh, i just wanted to try something and I thought, okay, um, uh, and I and I I was giving a speech uh, in Portland, Oregon, with a congressperson from the U.S. Um, House of Representatives, and he was writing a bill to submit to the U.S. Congress to declare a climate emergency. So he and I talked, and I titled this new paper a "Climate Emergency," and it really took off, and. Um, my co-authors and I gathered as much data on the climate as we could, both in the behavior of humans that affect climate change and then the climatic response. So we have two main variables. It's a very short text. This paper is available um, on the bioscience website free, just like the 2017. So all your viewers can uh, read it for themselves if they want. Uh, so, the, uh, so we plotted all the charts in a very simple, fashion. And again, uh, we're finding that when we look at these vital signs of climate change, that things are in big, big trouble. And uh, we published this, uh, this straightforward story uh, where hopefully everyone can understand. But the main thing that I want to uh, get across today is that this looks so serious that small or uh, piecemeal fixes don't seem likely to solve this problem. What I believe we need is a, a revolution of systemic changes in how humans operate on planet Earth. Uh, this, uh, and you'll see this when I mention the, uh, the six steps. So these are uh, as big a scale as, as we could think of 
that would directly affect the sustainability of humans on planet Earth with a climate that would be uh, habitable for us. Number one is energy. So we um, talk about um, the need to eliminate fossil fuel combustion and substitute with other forms of energy. So that is um, our number one uh, issue. That makes a lot of sense and it, it's, it's very uh, uh, much needed. Then uh, number two, we listed uh, uh, air pollution. And a lot of what we talk about here are the sh short-lived pollutants such as uh, methane and black carbon uh, or soot that uh, comes from uh, combustion of, uh, of materials. So these um, uh, air pollution uh, things can really help us in climate change in that, uh, for example, methane is a uh, short life gas. And if we can control that, we can uh, bring down some of the pressures on climate in the next decade or two. Then we, we even get bigger as we move on to the step three, which is that we must restore and protect uh, natural ecosystems on planet Earth. So this is where, um, uh, in nature, is where we store and sequester huge amounts of carbon. So for us to be successful in mitigating climate change, we need to preserve uh, forests and ecosystems and, uh, and wetlands and, uh, and estuaries and especially tropical forests and grasslands and savannas. So uh, we talk about um, preserving nature as a very important part. Then uh, the next one, number four, we talk about the food system. Agriculture and food production is one of the biggest stressors on, uh, on climate and the environment. So we talk about the need to, uh, for humans to lower their carbon footprint and environmental footprint by eating lower on the food chain and eating more plants and less meat. And we, we talk about uh, the importance of, of sustainable agricultural practices. Then we go, and number five, we move to the economy. And we think that um, continued uh, economic growth, that model is seriously flawed when we have a finite bios biosphere. So our resources are finite and we cannot continue to have uh, economic growth as our goal uh, forever. It just doesn't match up. So we are supporting um, uh, green economics uh, with our uh, economic uh, suggestions. And then uh, finally, we talk about um, the population issue. The human population um, really took off in the 1800s uh, with the start of the burning of fossil fuels and the industrial revolution. We had a, a population graph that just goes way, way up uh, in the last couple hundred years. And that uh, is, a lot of that is due to us um, now uh, using tons of fossil fuels. So we talk about the importance of us having a global discussion as to a, uh, a, an appropriate population size for uh, humans. And we talk about stabilizing population growth, potentially reducing it. And uh, then with all of these suggestions and steps, we are emphasizing the need for social justice. We think there are great inequities that need to be looked at in terms of economic inequities and social inequities. And uh, uh, we just think that it's important to prioritize uh, the uh, well-being of humans uh, all over. So uh, that is the context that we're, we're putting everything in. So those, that's
that's our fix right there. And of course, uh, it, you know, all of those things make sense. And uh, and what was advocated in, in 92 made sense and, 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 and earlier than that too. But there's a real issue, isn't there? Because, you know, many scientists and economists said that the, the real problem is that is that so much of the world's wealth is that 90% is concentrated in, you know, 10%, 1% of the population. So it's a tiny percentage of the population um, that are just massively over consuming. And so that's the, that's the crux of the problem. So I think that there is a risk at the moment that people feel that, you know, we can, by greening the economy, we simply switch to renewable energy, get, a, get an EV and carry on as, as, as before. And of course, we can't do that. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? In order to fix this environmental problem that we have today, that it's going to take more than a technological fix of building more solar panels or more wind turbines. Uh, I don't think technology is going to save us, uh, in, especially in the climate crisis. I think that's why uh, I uh, am uh, keen on the idea of the six steps that we're, we're mentioning. Uh, and uh, green energy is, is just part of the uh, first one in terms of uh, the uh, uh, the first step in the in the six. So I think um, that we're going to need to have systemic changes, and it's not just going to be an easy technological fix. And it seems yeah. like people are, want that easy fix and want technology to save them. And this go on I, business as usual. I think I think people like their creature comforts, um, mm -hmm. but I think part of it is that we haven't we haven't really been presented with a kind of view of of what life could be like. So 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 I think what people are hearing are these, you know, very unhelpful political views. You know, people saying, oh, you know, you just want to go back and live in caves, and you want to just go back to uh, medieval times, and and you know, sort of those kinds of ways of living. Um, but just thinking about the coronavirus pandemic, which is which is still with us, and you know, in the US it's been experienced really badly, and in the UK, you know, we have been, you know, it's been handled incredibly badly here. Um, but the the one really interesting thing that came out of what what was a tragedy was that politicians for for, for years have been saying that, you know, we can't do X, Y, and Z because it will crash the economy, and I couldn't believe that we moved into lockdown as quickly as we could in the UK. And it was almost as if the politicians actually found that they had a big red button and they could push that button and they could stop the economy. And that's, that's obviously what they have done. So I think in a sense, what it's given us is, it's given us some hope. It, you know, it, it's shown us what can happen. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not by any means a, a positive thing, but it's shown us that the, the, the that there is, that it is possible to stop the economy. And I wondered if so. So on the, off the back of the climate emergency paper in in November, where you're saying we've got a climate and ecological emergency, then we have the coronavirus pandemic and the World Health Organization saying this is a pandemic, and people responded appropriately to the pandemic. They responded and treated it as if it was an emergency, which of course it was. But why didn't they do that when you were sounding the alarm and saying we've got a climate emergency? And then, you know, and, this, and, and arguably, well, it's not arguably, but I would say, and I'm sure many would agree, that the climate and ecological crisis is, an, is a threat to life on the planet. It's a threat to, you know, we're seeing massive rates of extinction. So why, why is it, do you have any other thoughts as to why people responded differently to the coronavirus than they did to the climate and the declaration of climate emergency? Yes, uh, good question. I think the, the massive quick response to uh, COVID-19 was mainly due to, because it's an immediate threat to the health and well-being of individuals. So uh, that threat was so immediate and is so immediate that it gets a response where climate is much more chronic and moving along at a, at a different scale. And it's not a, such an in, individual personal threat uh, of uh, four people like um, the virus is. But uh, so I think that 
uh, we did do some amazing behavioral changes uh, for the for the coronavirus, and that gives me some hope that we can do changes. Uh, but uh, the two problems are are somewhat different. But uh, in in some ways, they have uh, they have solutions uh, that are similar. So if you look at our six steps, when we talk about um, agriculture and food and population and economy, those can affect the risk to of pandemics, just like the risk of uh, climate crisis. I think that's that's that is such a good point. Um, and in talking to some some psychologists recently, when I, um, I did an Ask a Scientist live event and, and put exactly that question to them, and and they said, well, one of the issues with climate climate science is that if you report changes in CO two levels for an ordinary person, that doesn't seem very threatening. If you're reporting with death rates, <laughs> that's that's threatening. <laughs> that's meaningful. Um, you know, in your town, in your neighbourhood, you know, say 50% of the people, you know, wow, that's. But a rise in CO2 levels, it's it's not immediately obvious how that's going to impact us and how it's going to affect us. Okay, uh, the one one last question I'd like to put to you, um, and it's it's. Um, it picks up on, on risk and it picks up on some work. Um, I think it was John Schellenuber who's been talking about the, the difference between we've got the reaction time and in, intervention time. So the um, so reaction time is you know how, how much time we need to actually um, respond and then intervention time is how much time we actually need to make it. And, and if there is a so long as we have enough time to do an intervention, then, then we can still act. But once we've run out of that time, then... So recently, um, an article came out which suggested that humanity within the next few years will, will reach a crossroads. We're going we're to have a decision foisted upon us, and we're going to have to decide whether we're going to continue down one route, which will be pretty much where we are, not doing, any, not doing things fast enough, or are we going to finally realize that life cannot go on as it, as, it, as it currently is and we're going to have to make a change? And I guess the question that I'm going to put to, to all the scientists I speak to is which way do you think we're going to go? Which way, which, do, you, do, you, do you have a, a sense of where you think humanity is actually going to, to go and why? Well, this is going to be a new experiment for uh, humans. Uh, we've never been through this. Uh, and uh, one thing I know is that nature is very resilient. And uh, I see that all the time. And so that gives me hope that regardless of how fast we act and how much we do at any one period, that uh, there is hope for uh, the resilience of nature, and somehow it, it's going to uh, work out. Now, on the other hand, uh, I can't believe how uh, dire the situation is, and it's uh, causing uh, people to have climate depression, and uh, some people are giving up hope. I'm an optimist. I um, am going to continue to have hope, and at the same time, try to do what I can uh, in terms of helping um, make uh, the information that's needed uh, available for huge changes on planet Earth. And then the second point I want to make is that I think that we will get much more reaction from individuals and governments after there's more suffering. So as we move into climate suffering, I think we will see uh, a much bigger reaction than we have so far. So uh, in terms of the timelines, uh, are we going to have enough time to make the changes? I don't know uh, about the timelines that you're outlining. I'm just thinking that we should put our heads down and do everything we can and uh, see how it shakes out. Now, uh, as a scientist, I find this um, climate uh, breakdown very interesting and the environmental breakdown interesting. But as a human, I'm horrified. 
and I, uh, it's just very unsettling. And, uh, but again, as a human and a scientist, I just want to do what I can to make a small contribution uh, to help towards a sustainable future. Thank you. And I think I think that's a good note to end on. You know, obviously you've you've already made a, a huge contribution because you've you've been working relentlessly. You've put out those warnings. You've you've um, you've had many thousands of people globally endorse them, and and we're doing what we can as scientists, warning to put that message out there. And of course, you know, we 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 have got some reason to to, to have. Well, to have hope, I think, in the integrity of humanity, because we only have to look at Greta Thunberg and the, 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 the striking school children, Fridays for Future, you know, all sorts of activist groups. Um, you, I mean, people are trying. And I think I think it's important to us as a, as a species to, to, to do what we can. We, it, we might not be able to do a huge amount for, for ourselves as a species, but the least we can do is um, is protect life on the planet, which is essentially what, what we're about. So, so I'd like to thank you very much for your time and for speaking to us. Um, um, this is the, the first in our, our new series of Heroes in Science. Um, so to anyone watching, if you haven't subscribed, please look at the subscribe button and subscri subscribe to Scientist Warning. Um, and then we will notify you of all of our future recordings. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Alison. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>